Thousands have gathered around the North Island to mark one year since Cyclone Gabrielle unleashed a devastating combination of rain and wind. It was one of the worst storms in New Zealand's history and a rare national state of emergency was declared which lasted a month. 11 people were killed and hundreds of lives changed forever. The damage in the billions. Alexa Cook is in Esk Valley. Alexa, how were people there feeling on the anniversary today? Well, Sam, it's just been a massive, massive day for them. There's still a lot of grief and heartache out there, but the anniversary events were really special and there were a chance for people to reflect on what a tough year it's been. Cyclone Gabrielle showed no mercy, her disastrous deluge of water wiping out entire communities, leaving hundreds of homes smothered in millions of tonnes of silt, causing pain and loss on an unimaginable scale. This was our treasure. And it's gone. Their treasured valley obliterated. A year later, only the weeds are flourishing. But the community is standing strong. About 100 of them gathered at Esk Valley's church this morning. Today is a community remembering what we've lost and being grateful for what we have. A process that hurts and also heals. They planted a kōwhai tree, a symbol of hope and growth. <laughs> While in Hastings, many others also came together. Ke kaha. A minute's silence to mark the traumatic events of one year ago today. When Gabrielle unleashed herself across the region, it was too much for the rivers. Many stock banks broke and the raging waters surged into and over homes, washing animals onto roofs and forcing people onto them too. Locals saved hundreds of people from drowning and while some made it, others did not. Shona Wilson is one of 11 who died in the cyclone. It's just ripped my heart clean out. One night that changed hundreds of lives forever. This is our beautiful valley. <laughs> the cyclone destroyed power and communication to thousands. And one of the main things people wanted was for their friends and family to know they were alive. We're still here. Don't forget about us. We're still on the map. Amy, Claire, we're all right. We're safe. Hi, Greg. Hi, Mike. Can't get you on the phone. Dozens of cut-off communities relied on aircraft like fertiliser planes to deliver fuel and supplies. Broken bridges were replaced with boats. That sucks naming a bridge. <laughs> then there were months of back-breaking work, clearing silt and debris. And although some homes have been demolished, many are still frozen in time. In this part of Category 3, nature is taking over. There are now plants and weeds where people once lived and will never live again. For people like Steve Wheeler, he still owns this land, but his insurance payout meant he could buy a new house. Good to see you. Oh, it's time to welcome you as well. <laughs> Good to see you. That's Lola. This is your new place. He's moved 20 minutes away to the top of a hill. Yeah. Terribly pleased that we are where we are quite excited that we are where we are and processing that the change has been forced upon us. As for 80 year old Ted, well we first met him when the government announced that they were red zoning his land. Don't care, I'm not moving, that's one thing I'm not doing. They can do what they like but I'm not, they'd have to drag me out by my ear, I'm not going anywhere. A feeling that's only grown stronger as time's gone by. It's one year on, how, how are you doing today? Yeah, we're battling along and, um, yeah, we're getting our fences done and we got quite, we're, we're doing all right, we're doing all right. We're not going anywhere. A sense of strength and determination that this region has shown over the past 12 months and will need for many years to come. OK, Alexis, so what happens next to those people affected? Well, Mike, there is still a lot of work ahead for them. As you can see, homes like this are yet to be demolished. And actually, the council is looking at the moment at potentially changing the buy-up policy so that some people might have to pay for this demolition themselves. They'll be voting on that next week. But, you know, I've, I've got to know these people over the past 12 months, and they're a really resilient bunch standing in that church today. It was 
quite overwhelming, quite emotional, but you could tell there was also a strong sense of hope that they will get through this. They just need a bit more time and it's going to take a lot longer than just one year. Yes, absolutely. That is Alexa Cook, our reporter live at Esk Valley. Thanks very much, Alexa. The residents of Wairo, south of Gisborne, gathered early this morning to remember how they relied on each other when they were completely cut off by the cyclone damage a year ago. While further north, a Tolaga Bay farmer was marking an anniversary of his own. Alice Wilkins reports. No one in Wairoa was facing today alone. Before the sun had risen, this small community was on the move. I think it's a sense of healing for everybody, you know, and just commemorate what's actually happened and how communities actually come together, which is really beautiful. It's been uplifting, you know, to see everyone that's turned out. This just brought us together even, even tighter, so, yeah, moving as one. And that they did through the streets in a hikoi, remembering the floodwaters that overtook their town a year ago, cutting Wairoa off with no roads in or out and no communication with the outside world. About 50% of properties were uninsured. We're moving nowhere on those, and we've just got to, and, and, and I'm getting sick of the criticism that they should have been insured. Well, these people took the gamble. They actually don't have a lot of money to actually do that, but they woke up one morning, and with, with no fault of their own, water came through their homes. And... Today, a series of carvings made out of materials collected from the town's flood-damaged buildings were unveiled. Further north, in Tolaga Bay, farmer Brendan Hewitt is grateful for what is behind him too, marking not only a year since the cyclone, but a year on Paro Station. He started a job as the farm's manager the day the cyclone hit. Yeah, no, this is my one year, one year anniversary. Silts and woody debris covered his farmland 12 months ago, forcing him to sell off stock that he suddenly couldn't feed. He's since had to regrass 70% of the land. I would say it's just about borderline bankrupt us to get ourselves back to the position we are now. One of his empty paddocks is now being used by the council to burn off some of the very slash that bowled through Tolliga. Forestry are trying to be better, but I don't think anyone has the answer. It's um, it's a 30, 40 year problem that's that's up there in those hills. And while the problem is almost out of sight now, he can't afford to face it again anytime soon. Alice Wilkins. And Alice, how is Gisborne City doing one year on? Yes, well, Michael, the central city isn't affected by widespread damage, but there is pockets of it around the place, like here in Vogel Street in the CBD, which has been left overgrown and practically deserted, apart from a couple of properties that can still be lived in. Gisborne Council says there are 63 properties considered Category 3. They are the ones likely to be part of the buyout, and they want that process wrapped up by June this year. There are an additional 151 properties that need to be lifted up and raised to be considered safe, and that's on top of other homes uh, that also need repairs and moderate modifications. So a long way to go. Alice Wilkins, kia ora. That's Alice Wilkins live in central Gisborne. Well, some cyclone-affected homeowners on Auckland's west coast say a new disaster is on the horizon, and it's economic this time. Category 3 households will get 95% of their market value under council buyout rules, meaning some homeowners with low equity could be priced out of the market. Nick Trubridge has the story. Welcome to Mike Hibbert's once bustling neighbourhood. This is what it's become. Grassy backyards buried by metres of rock and mud. So we're concerned about what happens in the, um, in the flow paths of the slip or the houses that get, uh, get removed through the buyout and, and um, how does that land get remediated into a condition that's you know, safe. The payouts are coming for those who have left, but some could be left financially decimated. Homeowners will get 95% of market value, so effectively they'll contribute 5%. The recent homeowners who don't own a lot of equity, they might have only been in their homes for a couple of years, um, that, that 5% 
can equate to 50% of their equity. Council says it won't budge on that. Those financial scars are mirrored by environmental ones. Atop the cliffs towering above Mike's neighbourhood, we reunite with Mike Glamuzina. It was um, chilling to say the least, spine chilling, horrible. His house is fine, but the landscape's changed forever. It's been difficult when you see people that, um, whose houses perhaps have been destroyed or other things have happened to them. It's very difficult to sort of broach a subject. It's, it's something that'll be hanging over us forever. In Karekare, scenes like this greet you on the valley floor. It's been a pretty long, rough year, um, but yeah, we're getting there slowly. And in Piha, it's as if times stood still in parts. Now this is typical of a number of sites here in Piha. The hillside has come down and swept through this house. It's completely decimated. I was talking to the owner earlier today. He's moved north out of Auckland. The stress of staying in this community, simply too much. But things have changed. This new map shows clusters of Piha that'll be equipped to communicate each part's needs to a central point. But what they really need is a reliable road. Access was, uh, was very compromised. I mean, not only um, uh, slips on the main road out, but also in the greater Waitakere Park area. I mean, a simple 40-minute trip into, into uh, the western part of the city became nearly two hours through broken roads. Some visual scars remain here, which is fitting. There's been plenty of progress, but there's a way to go. Nick Trueridge, News Hub.